Hi, Kat here for Lightwave Digital. In this video, we're going to be doing some Easter egg hunting inside of Lightwave 2025. Lightwave 2025 was released about a week prior to me recording this video here in April, and it's got some Easter eggs in it. I don't mean this Easter egg that I've got as a demonstration subject. I mean some cool hidden functions that you might miss or be looking for and you need a little bit of guidance on how to use them because some stuff has changed and some old stuff has returned from third party now integrated into the software so we're going to take a look at that as well first things first let's go and engage vpr here and we've got our lovely little egg i've got nothing on here for a color texture other than the actual colored surface uh, as well as just a little tiny bit of Bump mapping is being given to us through two crust textures. So I'm going to hit shift click and we'll bring up the surface editor and take a look at that really quickly. Nothing crazy. These are built in procedural textures that Lightwave has had for decades, mixed with the power of nodes, which we've also had for uh, about 20 years now since those have been introduced. Uh, Lightweight was one of the first commercial packages to do a full-blown nodal system. Um, but the procedural texture system in Lightwave, it's important to note, if you're not familiar with what that is, because you're new to CG, or you don't understand how it may necessarily work in Lightwave, uh, Lightwave has an extremely robust, robust procedural texture system that can work in a number of different areas, not just a surface editor or what you might refer to as a material editor. Uh, it can work in the areas of, say, if this was a spotlight, we wanted to do a projected image. We can do tricks where this uh, can be fed a procedural texture instead. Um, we've got functions where we can go into a light and change things for volumetric color and use procedural textures as part of what gives the uh, procedural volumetric effect its shape. There are things in the VDB system, um, displacements, even the graph editor can make use of procedural textures. So anywhere that you see a T button or you've got the ability to do something through a nodal editor inside of Lightwave, you can get access to all the procedural textures that can be used to drive various inputs. Now, for years, we had plugins from a very, very special developer out of France who was just amazing, and his name is Denis Fontanier. Uh, through a special agreement with Lightwave Digital, the new owners of Lightwave 3D that have been working diligently for the last three years to really improve the package, Dennis's plugins have now returned and are being integrated into Lightwave in both modeler and in layout. So going to the node editor for the surface editor you're going to notice a couple of sections in here i'm going to just point them out for you first one is going to be the dp filter obviously dp is for dennis Pontonier, and we've got access to a bunch of filters that are in here these are primary filters that can be used in the post area under image filter so you go to image filter get access to them here but if you can think of a way to use them in the surface editor you most certainly can but those are primarily for the uh, image filter area in the post processing but we've also got access to DP kit which is for displacement specifically We've also got a section here called RMAN Collection. Now, these are the RenderMan inspired procedural textures from the RenderMan render system. And all this is now integrated into Lightwave 2025. So just a hint, if you're an older uh, user or user that's coming back and you've used Dennis's tools in the past, uh, don't use your old plugins from Dennis to copy and paste into your current installation. They may cause a conflict with the ones that are being integrated into the software. Um, not everything is integrated just yet. These collections are complete though. The ones that do appear in the nodal and image 
processing area as well as in the displacement section but you'll notice that for the moment Dennis's light system is not integrated just yet hopefully we'll see that very shortly uh, over the course of the 2025 development cycle now getting back to some of the Rayman or Arman collection um, I really like playing around with some of the different procedural textures that come with this because they are incredibly powerful and they do uh, offer us a huge amount of uh, functionality that really you can only get out of a package like Houdini for example uh, especially when it comes to displacements but Lightwave makes it a hell of a more accessible and easier to use on so many different levels it's not to say that other packages don't have access to certain tools like this. It's just they're not as upfront and they're not as user friendly, in my opinion, than what you get out of Lightwave. So let's take this Penrose Brum and we'll just give ourselves a really harsh color here. And give ourselves kind of a different background color. Uh, something kind of purpley, sure. And we can pump that color in here. We'll get ourselves. Um, pretty crazy looking Easter egg. We've got to adjust our scale for this. I'm just going to center in on that Easter egg. Make sure it's selected first. There we go. So point one, point one. And get some really interesting patterns. All right, so of course these can be mixed and matched through the power of nodes with any of the other procedural textures that are available in the Arman collection, whether they be 2D or 3D, uh, and anything else that uh, ships with Lightwave or uh, is available through par third party. Um, that's just one Easter egg that's in here. The next Easter egg is something that um, uh, some people have had you know, a good understanding of for years, but it got moved and the way that it was moved and then integrated into the uh, system that's now in kind of confused people. And it's kind of something that um, has been a point of contention for users, but it really just took a, a better understanding of what the actual system was doing and how to use it. But there has been significant improvement over it. And what I'm talking about is reconstruction filters. Uh, in 3D programs, when a render is being produced, and it's being turned into you know, ray information where it detects color or some kind of displacement on an object and it renders it back to um, a color uh, result, uh, there is a process where that pixel uh, needs to be processed and how it's processed is through a reconstruction filter. Reconstruction filters um, can be a godsend in the sense that depending on what you're doing for an image, if you have a lot of like um, high frequency noise on a texture or you have issues with um, not enough samples being thrown at a texture that has a very high specular uh, surface property and you got glints all over it uh, some people call them fireflies the reconstruction filters that are now in the buffer section have been improved to allow you to reduce a reliance on throwing huge amounts of minimum and maximum samples in the camera anti-aliasing system or if you have a surface with reflectivity and refraction and it's causing you problems, uh, you do the overrides. You don't necessarily have to rely on that there as much. And of course, under the render properties under render, there was also a reflection and refraction and subsurface scattering um, global samples that you could throw at it. So in those different areas, um, you might try to load balance, so to speak, all those different values uh, when really the, it was the reconstruction filter that was responsible for uh, producing some of these problems. And therefore, the reconstruction filter needed to you know, kind of step up and um, do its job properly. And the reconstruction filter um, rewrite, so to speak, between 2018 and later uh, wasn't totally completed. But now in 2025, it's been vastly improved. So we can get much better results very quickly without having to throw all that effort, both from your own personal effort as an artist trying to fix the problem and the software and your computer 
working super hard to render the problem by throwing more power at the problem. So it's a smarter way to work. Uh, let's get a better texture on this. Let me open my preset shelf here. And we're going to go for something that's, um, well, let's see, ceramic. Uh, that might work. Yeah, that's kind of neat. Uh, I think a different one, a little bit more metallic. Let's go to the metal section. Oh, by the way, we also have a whole slew of new presets in here for you. So make sure you check those out. Um, chrome lines. Let's try that one. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Let's go to make a couple of adjustments here. Oh, this isn't too bad. I just want to give ourselves a little bit of a more tight response on this surface. All right, so we're going to look at that through the object, the camera. So we can see that this surface, you know, generally it feels okay, um, but you'll notice that in certain situations, depending on the glancing angle of light or the surface has um, uh, got some, you know, really fine micro bumping to it, or there's some kind of masking that's causing uh, a specular glint or something that might be an issue at render time, or it just pops out and it screams at you. Uh, the reconstruction filters can help to uh, reduce the uh, appearance of that, if not eliminate it completely, and it doesn't really do a huge amount of um, work in the background to achieve that. So it's a much more efficient way to help fix these problems rather than just throwing minimum and maximum samples and going nuts that direction or in other areas. Uh, let's put a little bit more uh, bumping on this and see what else we can get to. Stand out. Uh, let's go plank length uh, 50%. That'll help give us a, another groove in there. That's good. Twenty-five percent, or twenty percent. Get a couple of them in there. There we go. More sharpness, five. More width, ten. Yeah, that's a little better. So now we can kind of see problematic areas like this little bit here that doesn't seem like it's gonna clean up nicely. Now to verify that, we really need to be looking through the camera, and while VPR will help give you a visual indication of what's going on. I always recommend doing a test render with this because uh, the reconstruction filter plus whatever you've got for your anti-aliasing settings um, and other factors are all going to work together. And while the VPR render engine is a production render engine uh, that you can use, it is actually the same kind of um, system. There are some times where VPR in the preview layout window won't represent what you actually get in the file render um, because it's um, partially limited to how many ray recursions you've got and some other factors. So let's take a look at uh, the light here, the key light, and we're going to pump up some values just to really demonstrate some of those areas that might give us an issue. If you have the problem with fireflies or certain stuff not cleaning up and you've never been able to figure it out, the reconstruction filters now will help you deal with that. Okay, so the default is one with a Gaussian reconstruction filter. You can go with a traditional box and you can see right away the change that's been applied. It looks very blurry. That's a very classic and old approach to dealing with this type of issue. Very old reconstruction filter. And if you remember from the days when we had this function in the camera, um, these different types of algorithms are explained in the manual in detail and how they work on a subpixel level. But in older versions of Lightwave, 
let's say Mitchell Soft or um, Mitchell Sharp or uh, some of the other variables that we got uh, didn't really totally 100% work properly. So these new reconstruction filter improvements that are now available on the buffer side of things makes it a heck of a lot simpler to troubleshoot this stuff and make sure that your uh, results are expected as expected when you get your final image results out the back end um, so that you can turn your composite of all these buffers back to the way you want to see it. Uh, let's take for an example, um, Lancro Sync. We didn't have access to the actual mathematical input for the formula in older versions. Now we do. We also use custom names underneath it, but this is a function that's always been available since 2018. But now we can start uh, working with the reconstruction filters directly and getting them to do under the hood what we need them to do without going nuts trying to find the right sweet spot for this stuff. Very simple to use. Results are immediately apparent in VPR. And of course, at any time, do a couple of test renders. Depending on which formula you're working with. Just to make sure it cleans up in the actual production render. And you can see that this is just using the default anti aliasing settings. Uh, I didn't have to throw anything else at it, and it comes out pretty clean. Um, you know, it can be used to soften an image, but if you want to do something like that, you probably do that in post a heck of a lot, e uh, a heck of a lot easier. And of course, you've also got the filter radius in the camera that you can work with. And should you need it for edges in motion blur or similar, um, you can increase these values to four or to sixteen, four and sixteen. Generally. Um, pretty good, but with the access to these new improved reconstruction filters, start as low as you possibly can, so serve the render time. Um, I know that Lightweight Digital has stated that they've gotten between a 30 and 50% render speed boost just by implementing these better filters. So that's two sets of uh, hidden Easter eggs in Lightweight 2025. We'll have more information about the other ones that are now in the package.